Welcome to This Week in BJJ, the only show running the gamut of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and running it live every Friday night. Hello guys and welcome to a new episode of This Week in BJJ. I'm Budo Jake. Today is December 14th, 2012. And I'm joined as usual with Budo Dane. How's it going, Dane? Dude, I'm great. I'm a little bit on a jiu-jitsu overload after the seminars last week and then we have this show coming up, so. Yeah. We had a long weekend last week, yes, packed we did. full of jiu-jitsu. And we're here with uh, Sean Williams, who's here, as usual, after any big event to uh, to talk about some of the things that happened last week. Did you recover from the weekend, Sean? Yes, I... maybe. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, it's good. A lot of, a lot of great stuff. Mm-hmm. And I'm uh, excited to hear about your seminars. Sure. Well, first, let's introduce the third guest, fourth guest of the show. Uh, Budo Day brought in some Abita Christmas Ale seasonal. What do you guys think about this? I love it. Yeah. It's yeah, it's stuff. nice. It's really nice. It's heady when you pour, though, so be careful. Yeah. So, yeah, like we like we we're talking about, we had a full weekend of jiu-jitsu. Dane and I went to two seminars last weekend. One was with Leandro Lowe and Kyle Terra, since they were in town for the uh, IBJJ Pro League. And uh, let's talk about that one. That was, uh, that was a fantastic seminar. One, I think the first thing, because I've been to a couple seminars, the format was different than nearly anything I've been to. Mm-hmm. Um, Kayo and Leandro played off each other. So Leandro showed a sweep. They would have us drill it and then call everyone back for question and answer about what we were working on, have us drill it again, have us call us back, are you guys having any troubles? And so they were troubleshooting like in the middle of it. And then Kayo showed a response to what Leandro just did. Yeah. Then Leandro showed a response to what Kayo did and then Kayo showed another response. Just like you want from a seminar of high-level guys, they were always available to ask questions. Right. Like a Q and A session where we could ask all kinds of stuff. It was well worth the cost. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah. What was the most uh, things you took away from a day? To be honest, I'm still sorting through all of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been using the first sweep that Leandro showed, which is cool. It's kind of um, his his play off the leg lasso. Um, and I, I do a bit of an X card, so that he showed another X card thing, and I've been I've been looking at that, but I haven't been in that situation. But I almost feel as if this is going to pay off in a couple months from now, once I start digesting it and really start internalizing it. I think it wasn't one of those ones where I take it and I run off to the academy and I'm good with it. It's it's more one of those things that it's going to need to marinate in me a bit. What yeah, and anybody that's trained with Kyle knows he throws a ton of details oh, at yes, you. And and like he said when he closed the seminar, he said, you might not remember all the details, but hopefully you remember some concepts that might help you with not only these techniques but other ones as well. What was your fit? What, what did you take away? Yeah, um, open guard passes, passing leg lasso and uh, mm. spider guard. It's incredible stuff. Oh, that's Loved awesome. It. Those two guys are sick. Yeah. yeah. Kyle's just a trick master, and, and Lowe has such a good arsenal of well, a lot, a lot of good sweeps, you know, and mm-hmm. bullfighting and stuff. So, envious of you guys. <laughs> you do, the, you do Q and A's at your seminars, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I do Q and A's, and I do that in class a lot too. But you know, with seminars, the main thing I always say is just take away something. You know, if because take notes after the seminar and and make sure you get at least one thing, and then the seminar's worth it. Anything mm-hmm. you right. take away is worth it. So, right, because if you try to remember everything, sometimes you. Know, forget it all so when you program a seminar do you do you kind of go in there thinking you're going to give them more so that somebody can take something or is it like you program it so that everybody can take everything does that make sense yeah no no i don't try to uh, keep it in mind that everybody's going to take everything because because there's always all sorts of levels at at seminars like you know there'll be the new guy and then there'll be the brown or black belt that's there as well so I try to get something for everyone that someone, you know, they can take away one, two, three, four things right. that will help their game. I always try to have something that will help everybody's game immediately. And then, you know, techniques that will, over time, they'll be able to put into play if they want. The marinade techniques? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good, that's a good. But I've, I've never done the dueling banjo thing. Like, you know, like these guys had, Kai, you just said Kyle was going one and then Lowe was going off a hint, like, that's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, that was a nice little twist. Yeah. And there was a lot of guys in attendance that had uh, notebooks and taking notes from the seminar. You know, seminars aren't cheap, so you want to make the most out of it. I thought that was yeah. a good idea. There was one guy I was talking to before the seminar. He was a new student, didn't even have a gi. Huh. And that surprised me that you would spend the money to go to a seminar <laughs> and not even have a gi. <laughs> uh, but uh, that being said, I think uh, it was it was well worth it. And if, if Kyle's ever in your town or Leandro Lowe, 
be good for you to, to go to it. And sir, if you're watching yeah. this, I know a great place where you can buy a gi. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> uh, see, so after that, we uh, jetted down to Mission Viejo for yes. AJ Agus Arm Seminar. AJ is one of the up and coming uh, Gracie Baja brown belts. He competed a lot in 2012, and he showed things straight out of his game: single leg takedowns to guard passes. So it's always good to go to a seminar where you see the moves that the guys actually do. You know, and one of the things I was, I mean, I was happy about him showing it in gi because he has great gi singles and doubles, mm -hmm. which require a little bit of special setup. You know, you can't just drop levels and shoot because you'll get stuff. Absolutely, yeah. It's, it's great that uh, he combines the grip fighting with the singles and the doubles because right. it's, it, it's different. It's different, and, and you can get a super high-level wrestler, but if they don't understand that grip fighting, they're going to have to shoot from a pretty far away, and if their setup isn't good, like that single leg or that double is going to definitely lose its percentage. Right. So, yeah, it's always good when when let wrestlers learn to grip fight and combine that stuff. Yeah. That was a really nice seminar. AJ had a little uh, giveaways, gave away some Budo Videos products and Gracie Mag and some other stuff, so. Two great seminars. Oh, and it was worth mentioning it was a charity event as well for, yep. uh, Feed, for uh, Feed LA. Yep. Right? That's right. Great. All right. We got some other news to talk about. First thing on today's agenda, a couple of legends are coming back to meet each other. Mm. These guys fought years ago talking about De La Hiva and Yuki Nakai. A lot of guys know who De La Hiva is. That the man who's who's the the, the guard Dale Hiva guard is named after, and Yuki Nakai is uh, arguably the most important jiu -jitsu, Brazilian jiu-jitsu guy in Japan. Mm. He fought Hickson Gracie. Um, you might have seen him in the choke video where he gets his eye gouged out Ugh. by Gordo, and um, and he's developed the Podestra line of schools in Japan. So he's done a great job in Japan, and he fought Dale Hiva uh, years ago. And I don't know if you guys have seen the match. It was pretty slow moving. Uh, I don't really understand the rule set that they were using. When I watched it, it looked like De La Hiva should have won. But by the rule set they were using, you can Akai won. So they're going to have a retirement match in September of this year. It's cool watching like a repeat of history. Like watching, this is more or less a pretty historical match. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's a, a bit of a hallmark, right? Probably the last time we'll see De La Hiva competing. Right. So he says anyway. What do you think about having legends uh, matches like this, Sean? Oh, I think it's cool. Uh, you know, it. Both of those guys have uh, done huge things for the sport, so um, it's a win-win. Both guys win, in my opinion. They're all they're out there showcasing themselves, and you know, and it's fun. It's fun for the people who know who they are, and also the people who don't know who they are to take a look and like sort of pay homage, like, oh, that's who De La Hiva is. Oh, that's who Yuki Nakai is. Like that, you know, they've been in the sport for a long time, so. I think it's awesome. Some of these old guys don't have the cardio or the strength of the younger guys. Do sure. you think they're as fun to watch? I would say so. Yeah, I mean they're still technical, you know. So it, you know, it matches look the way they do because of the the attributes or whatnot they have. Like if you watch uh, good women's jujitsu, they don't they're not as strong or a, as explosive as the men either. But because both um, athletes are in the rel in relatively the same ball game. Looks exactly the same as if you watch right. two guys. So um, these two guys, if they're in the same ball park with athleticism, and the, it'll look as just like two twenty year twenty two year olds going at it. You know, their their paces will match each other. Their strength's going to match each other. Their technique, you know, may or may not match each other. So it'll still be a very entertaining match. Yeah. Don't have any more details of uh, when and where that's going to be. All I know is September 2013, but we'll keep you guys updated. Another guy who's doing great things for the sport mm. is Lloyd Irvin. He is having a BJJ Kumite, he calls it. And uh, it's basically brown belts from around the world competing at his academy. And uh, I haven't been able to get any results out of, out of Lloyd. Have you guys? No. I'm surprised at how well, I mean, given this is the internet and the social media age, how well it's been under wraps. Yeah. I did hear that someone tried to sneak two pills under their belt. 
but they they disallowed it. <laughs> <laughs> they caught it. They caught him. Yeah, it's yes. not being uh, televised Kumate. anywhere. Kumate. Yeah. <laughs> so Sean and I were talking. Can we get that music play right? <laughs> right. For everybody to know, Sean Kumate. and I were talking about how we pretty much love this event for the uh, blood sport reference. Yes. And if you don't know what that is, you need to watch it immediately after the show. And that's what my pill reference was to. <laughs> was it to something else? <laughs> you know, crushing the pills, throwing it in the eyes. Yeah, it was I what a classic they, movie that was. I wonder if they can do the awesome. half pipe, the weird half pipe mat at the oh, end. Oh, that would be even mm. more. Mm. Somebody tried that. There was an MMA event that had that. Really? It, it bombed. <laughs> <laughs> you don't say. <laughs> So yeah, this tournament is not being televised yet. I'm not sure exactly what Lloyd's intentions are with the footage, but um, there's been a lot of speculation and, and hopes to see how AJ Agazarm is doing and Sean Roberts and all these other top level brown belts. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. It's cool. Like, yeah. it's yeah. cool to see the brown belts get some love. Oh yeah, absolutely. They kind of live under a shadow, but you see great brown belt matches all the time. Yeah. Oh yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. And. And when in tournaments that have mixed, you know, like uh, nogi tournaments, for example, you'll sometimes you see the brown belt beat the black belt. So right. it's not yeah. it's not like you become a superstar once you're a black belt. But that's where the media focus is certainly on. Right. Yeah. 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 So another tournament, uh, we had two tournaments last weekend on mm. Saturday. We had the fall open in the morning and the pro league in the in the evening. Um, we focused the live broadcast on the pro league, but there was some cool stuff that happened in the fall open. There were some guys that qualified for the pro league. Um, basically by getting gold medals of the fall open. Samu Braga didn't have a match, so he just no. walked right into the pro league. Lucky to be a light guy. Uh, Sandro Santiago, Batata, he uh, got the featherweight gold. Tanner Rice, who we're going to look at a little bit later, he got the lightweight gold. And he's a name that not a lot of people knew, but should be on everybody's radar I think he put, him on the, he put himself on the radar. Yeah. John Carlquist took the middleweight gold. Eduardo Tellis took the heavyweight gold. Diego Herzog and Raul Castillo took the medium heavy. Uh, Gustavo Pires took the ultra heavy, and Rafael Fischetti didn't have a fight. So those are all the guys that uh, made their way into the pro league finals. Dane, you were there earlier, weren't you, that day? No, I got there in time for the the IBJJ pro. Okay, so I think most of us focused mostly on on the pro league. We're right. going to talk more about yeah. that. But um, it was it was a good event. I think having having it this late in the year it took a lot of people. Um, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people didn't do the fall open. Especially like Samuel Braga being able to walk right into the, the tournament, you'd yeah. think that with money on the line, that he would have some competition. Well, I asked Sam about that in the stands, and I was like, well, I, I don't understand if there's a payout at the end, um, why more people didn't join up. And he told me he's because a lot of people are recovering from injuries. You know, they finally say, this is my cutoff date. You know, they'll compete at either Nogi Worlds or before injured. And then they say, you know what, it's done. I've got to, I've got to stop and I've got to recover. Otherwise, I'm not going to be good for next year's. European Opens, Pans, Worlds, so. But, you know, there's some notable big names that were missing on Saturday. The Mendes Brothers, right. um, Adolfo Vieira, you know, you could go down the line. There were some great names there, but some of the big names were missing. And that tells me that a gold medal to those guys mm -hmm. is worth more than $5,000. I think that's a very good point, yeah. It's a weird economy with that, right? <laughs> Especially with guys like the Mendes Brothers who make their career off of their name and, their sh and, and showing up, right? It, there's not a one-to-one -one translation between dollars and actually having that world medal and the regard that comes with it, right? Yeah, yeah, and being being peaked for the right time, and yeah, I think a lot of the people want to guard that, you know, and make sure that they're they're ready for tournaments and probably yeah, and also potentially this was like sort of a late uh, comer in the tournament world, and so people weren't prepared f to. To, to go there and yeah I think that all of those factors played a oh, sort of a perfect storm for that so uh, I, and then so from what I'm saying do you think people would have maybe um, factored their competition season differently if they knew that, that this was at the end of the possible tunnel? I think it'll be interesting to see what happens next year right I do think the money thing is a very good point I think a, a gold medal at the world is worth you know I, th I think it's priceless um, but I think if they knew know ahead of time, they can maybe plan out their year accordingly. So maybe they do December instead of a different tournament, you know, and mm -hmm. take January off or something like this. So, do you think it's difficult? Because most people mm -hmm. focus on the gi at least in the spring and the summer for the pan and the worlds. Then they go into nogi season, do the nogi pan, nogi worlds. Then all of a sudden, there's now this gi tournament right after the nogi worlds. Yeah. Is that you think that's difficult for guys? That could be. I don't. I don't think. I don't think transitioning to uh, from nogi into gi 
with if you're doing it all year round, the, the guys are all training all year round anyway. So I would say that that's probably not too big of a factor because um, it's it's kind of a, it's about a month away. So I, I would say that that should that should be a plenty of time to sharpen back up your gi game. Yeah, I, I think so. Jake, we were we were talking with someone I forget who, but we were they were, they were saying maybe if they switch the date or the month, and you had a pretty good explanation as to why the IBJJ Pro is when it is. Which yeah, that was Sammy Braga we were talking about. Oh, that's he said, right. you know what, I wish it was in January because I want to relax in December. And I was telling him, you know, the the reason the guys get invited for this tournament are be based on their ranking throughout the year. So it's at the hell at the end, end of the year because you count up all the points from before. If we throw that in January, then, you know, it could be, it could be strange if there's tournaments in December or January as well. Yeah, that could play a factor. We've got some more stuff to talk about on the Pro League Finals. We're going to take a look at some of the finals matches also when we come back, so don't go anywhere. BudoVideos.com, home of the world's largest selection of quality jujitsu kimonos. Show your roll, Storm, Tatami, Bull Terrier, Venom, and others. Styles from more than 30 top brands in stock and ready to ship. BudoVideos.com, you're only a click away from owning a new gi today. All right, welcome back, guys. So, uh, Pro League. There were, before we take a look at the finals matches, there were a few matches that didn't happen. And a lot of people weren't too happy about that. Not a lot of people knew about the relationship, and that's all I'll say, between Landra Lowe and Samir Shantri and Kyle Terra. They were all training together before this tournament, and they didn't rec they didn't sign up under the same team. So it didn't uh, throw off any bells at IBJJF that there might be any anything there. But uh, Leandro only had one match the whole day. Yeah. His first match was supposed to be against Kishino, who <coughs> is um, one of Kyle and Samir's teammates. He decided not to do that match. Uh, Kishino basically gave it to him. Then the second match was supposed to be against Samir, and Samir let him go through also. So that's one of the things that the IBJF was trying not to have. So they would pair up teammates early on to make them fight. Um, a lot of the Gracie Baja guys fought, mm -hmm. but, um, but they didn't. So it'll be interesting to see. This was the first IBJJ Pro, but I'm sure that IBJF will take some steps to avoid that happening in the future. Nobody wants to see that. Right. No. I think it should be punishable by death. <laughs> <laughs> Kumite. <laughs> yeah. Kumite. <laughs> yeah, Kumite to the dead. <laughs> yeah, well, I wondered that. You know, I, we only saw him. I saw him getting ready to go at uh, Lowe's, and then nothing. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, the finals. Right. And so. Tanner Rice had a beautiful match we're going to take a look at. And then all of a sudden, we didn't see him anymore. Yeah. And come to find out, I, I'm not sure if he was injured or if he gave the match to Lucas Lepre, his teammate. Um, but suffice to say, he only had one incredible match. Lepre made it to the finals. So I'm sure something will be done. But, um, you know, in a tournament setting, when there's no cash on the line, I think, oh, okay, fine. You can do that kind of stuff. But that, the Pro League is supposed to be something for the masses. It was a free broadcast. Um, people don't want to watch that. Right. I mean, it was, yeah. I thought it was billed as a showcase event. Yeah. Would you guys agree? Yeah. 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 You and don't see that in the Olympics. Correct. You don't. Yeah. You see two countrymen fighting each other if they make it to that uh, point. So, yeah. I, I know it's a hard. It is. It's a hard part. It's it's easy for us on the sidelines to go like, oh, you should fight. You know, right. it's another thing when you're sweating together and training together. Like it is. I believe it is hard to get out there and and fight against your teammate. But other guys do it. Gracie Baja, we saw a lot of it actually um, that day. Uh, and it's they're not the only team, but there are other teams. Hey, they fight. They do it. They do it. So I think. Uh, it, it would be a good thing if all the athletes said, you know, it, yeah, is it going to stink? Yeah, it is. But that's what we're that's what we're there for. You know, we're there to to do this, and we're friends afterwards, and we're still training partners. And so. speaking of Tanner Rice, I think he had probably, uh, arguably, this one of the standout matches of the of the yeah, day for sure. Absolutely. Um, he fought Tanquinho in the opening round, and I I didn't talk to anybody who thought there was a remote possibility that Tanner could beat Tanquinho. <laughs> Tanquinho is an incredible competitor, um, impossible to sweep, great stand-up, great guard, and uh, let's take a look at what happened. Tanner Rice is fighting out of Cabrinha's gym. Here he was, uh, Tanquinho was almost out of the bounds. Tanner brought him right back into the middle. Yeah, very smart. Does it again. again. Yeah, it's <laughs> smart. It's worth noting Tanquinho's been on fire this year. Yep, he's very smart with the rules. Right, very smart with the rules. Yeah, it's really sweet to 
what Tanner did there. And here's a nice sweep because, man, it's so hard to put Tanquinho on his back. Mm -hmm. Excellent job. I think Tanner's 19 years old. <laughs> Incredible wow. accomplishment. So in the first round, Tanquinho was knocked out. Sean, do you think phenomenal. there was there was a, like when Tanner saw that you know that was his match? Do you think there was a sense of comeuppance for him that he was just like, all right, let's do this? Or yeah, I'm sure I'm sure it's mixed emotions. One one side of you, right? One side of you would like to say, wow, this is an opportunity of of my career so far to fight this great guy. Even if I lose, who cares? But the other side, probably that the in the athlete <laughs> side, you're thinking, oh crap. That's right. Tanquinho, you know, and, and you have to be careful. I, there's mixed emotions there. You're battling with yourself saying, well, I know if I do this, he's going to counter me because it's Tanquinho. And then the other side, I think, is, yeah, you're fired up. You get more I mean, super fired up to fight such a great guy. Right. Yeah, he had nothing to lose. Yeah, and it's a real honor, you know, and you fight guys that are like Tanquinho's ability. That's an honor for, you know, anyone to be able to, to fight with that guy. So I think the right mindset's to be fired up about it. Right. The first final of the day was Caio Terra versus Lercio Fernandez. Caio uh, was having had a great matches earlier. He beat um, Daniel Beleza with mm -hmm. a with a toe hold, yeah. and uh, met Lercio Fernandez in the finals. Let's take a look here. This one was back and forth. It was really close. Yeah, super close. But these guys are awesome. <laughs> I mean, no spoilers, but there were really no blowouts in the matches we saw. I almost wonder why guys go for toe holds when you know, for example, Kyle can't be footlocked. Is it just for the advantage, Sean? Yes, absolutely. Mm. Advantages and points and, yeah, strategy. That's a nice little move he uses right here. Yeah, I hadn't seen him use that for a while. He used to use that a lot, Kyle, but uh, must be sharpening that tool back up. Mm -hmm. Almost triangle there. Little mistake right there, because that's this is where Larcio went on the foot. There's a little mistake for, for uh, Kyle to shoot to 50-50, and he put his foot right into a footlock, which whether that's hurting or not, it looked like there was a little pain on Kyle's yeah, face. Yeah, that thing was on there for a minute. And then a real nice job to scramble out. Kyle took that by two advantages. Super close. Really close. Guys, we're here with Kyle Terra, the first ever champion of the IVJJ Pro League. Tell us how your experiences were today. Uh, it was a very good experience. Uh, I, I don't know. I wasn't. I woke up and wasn't feeling uh, like. On my best, I mean, of course, tra during the fight, you know, it's different, but I had this sensation like, man, I'm not feeling too confident today, you know, and I'm very glad it happened that way, you know, but, uh, you know, I don't even know what to say. It was, it was a good thing, you know, that I won, but it surprised even me. Well, you had some great matches. You had an excellent footlock against Daniel Beleza, a match that I've been looking forward to for a long time. Yeah, yeah. And, but, you know, it wouldn't be an interview with Kyle Terra if we didn't talk about your injuries. And I saw a lot of tape on your ribs. What's going on there? Yeah, uh, I don't even know what, like, uh, you know, three, uh, four days ago, I, I, uh, uh, I don't know how to say that in English, but it's not like broken. It's like one rib went on top oh. of the other. Mm -hmm. And it hurts every time I do this, you know. And the side that he was passing, the De La Riva was in that side, so it was hurting myself. You know, it wasn't like, uh, you know, it was actually harder for me to pass, but I didn't actually, didn't try. To do guard, it was fine unless, you know, I did this type of movements. It wasn't like bothering me too much, you know, but... Do you think we can get you on a strength and conditioning program to strengthen you up? Yeah, I, I actually stopped, you know, doing the strength and conditioning because, it, you know, just so many things happened at the end of the year. I think that's why a lot of people didn't compete because, you know, everybody's so tired. I was very pumped when it when it first you know happened They're like they invited and, and the invitations and everything and then like after two weeks training I was like man I'm exhausted of competing this year I don't want to do it anymore you know and that's why I maybe woke up today and said I don't even want to be here you know but you know I'm glad it happened that way because I beat very 
tough opponents, you know. Well, of course, it wasn't the way that I wanted, but, um, you know, it was still very good, you know, to beat those guys that are, you know, on the top of the, the category. Absolutely. We always love you to see you compete, and you did a great job today. Congratulations on the championship. Thank you. The, ne the second match, uh, finals match of the day, was Leandro Lowe versus Lucas Lepri. Uh, they've met, I think, two times before, and yeah. uh, I think Least. Leandro took the win both times, if I'm not mistaken. I think they've met, I think it might be three now, I'm not sure, and I think that uh, Lepri has won. But I, I, I might be a little off on that. But. but suffice to say, these guys have met a few times before. Let's take a look at the highlight of their finals match. Some nice stuff right here. <laughs> Near pass. Yeah, the Q&A at Kai's seminar, a couple of people asked about it. Ask Leandro for his uh, trainer pass. Yeah, he's got a vicious bullfight pass. One of the best in the sport. Nice roll back to the guard. Lepre was threatening the back there. Yeah, Lowe was smart to just get to his back. Yeah. <coughs> It's amazing to see matches with so much movement like this, but not a not a not even an advantage on the board for Lepre. Yeah, so until close. that, until there. Yeah, close but not really <clears throat> close there. It's almost it was a nice move to go for that arm, but a few inches off. Actually, during this match, I remember saying to Terry when I was in the stands that I'm glad I'm not having to commentate this match because there's so much going on. Hey, Andrew Lowe, you've been a big name in Brazil for a long time. You're making yourself more and more well-known in America. You have to be happy about your performance today. Okay. You're always more famous in the United States. You have to be happy today. Yeah, I'm very happy because the work I've done this year is doing everything right, thanks to God. All the championships I've won that I've been able to win, that was the PAN, the Mundial and the League Pro now. And... Foi bom, a Deus. He's very happy because uh, all the events that he's, all the training that he's been doing this year is is going on right, you know, and I'm very glad that that's happening and uh, uh, he was able to win all the gi tournaments in America, like the Pan Ams, Worlds with the gi, and uh, the Pro League, so he's very happy about it. So you were pretty fortunate that Samir Chantry let you advance in the brackets. Why do you think Samir did that? Por que você acha que o Samir fez isso? Deixou você passar? Porque a gente é grande amigo, grandes amigos, treinamos bem. E ele é pena e eu sou leve, né? E eu ia lutar com um cara peso leve. Eu acho que seria mais certo eu lutar, né? Se caso fosse um peso pena, eu passaria para ele, né? Pena que... natural. Pena natural seria. Uh, uh, Samir is a, fe is a featherweight, a natural featherweight, and uh, that's why you know. He let Leandro go because we train together a lot, and uh, you know, uh, it would that's, that would be the right thing, since he was fighting a lightweight guy. And you fought Lucas Lepre a couple times before. Did you feel confidence going into that match? Você já lutou com Lucas Lepre muitas vezes. Você estava confiante? Não, nunca, nunca estou confiante. Só na hora eu vejo se vai dar para ganhar ou não. No, he wasn't uh, like that confident because he beat uh, Lepre before. But uh, he he only comes in the mat and see, and, the and, and, and see like depends on the day you know and then he feels like he, today I'm ready or not. Well, congratulations on your championship. Oh, thank you. The third match of the day was one that everybody was excited about the possibility of happening <laughs> once we saw the names of uh, of the people that were in the tournament. I'm talking about Homolo Bahal versus Andre Gaval. They had met once before with Homolo Bahal being the winner uh, at Black Belt. And this was only the second time, but uh, it didn't disappoint, did it? No, no. Oh. This was awesome. Man, what a great match. Let's take a look at some of the highlights. Homolo Bahal being one of Gracie Baja's best competitor, competitors and Andre Gaval being one of the leaders of Atos Jiu-Jitsu. Nice sweep. 
I mean, not to take anything away from home a little bit, I think we definitely saw the height advantage come into play here as well. I think one of the things that makes uh, Homolo's open guard and spider guard so effective is his long legs, huh? Right. Yeah, look, nice triangle attempt there. He looked on point the whole day. He looked yeah. on fire. It was just, man. Comes another big sweep here. Nice. Uh, Andre recovers really nicely here t to avoid the, the points there, though. Yeah, you saw Andre's eyes go immediately to the scoreboard. Next guard sweep there. Yeah, really nice. Let's see. Galvon, nice double leg tie, but try, but Omolo did a nice job of avoiding that one. This was beautiful. This reminds me of, of Andre versus Polaris. <laughs> that was such a nice reshot there on the mm -hmm. single. This is a really nice job. So the match was tied, went to ref's decision, Homolo took it, and it was super close. I mean, yeah. that, that was a hard call. It wasn't even a unanimous decision. Okay, here with IBJJ yeah. Pro Champion, Homolo Bahal. Man, you had an incredible finals match. In all your other matches leading up to it, you were really on point. You feeling really good for this tournament? Uh, yeah, yeah, I have been training really hard, you know, like, uh, I just stopped for like a month, like, uh, traveling for seminars, and then, you know, I came back from my trip, and then I started training really hard for this tournament, and then, you know, like, uh, it go really well, so I'm very happy. At Black Belt, this is the second time you've met Andre Galvao, is that right? Exactly. Uh, we met, I think, uh, 2011, uh, last year, in the Samurai Pro. And then uh, I won, I think, by 4-2, and then uh, today. That was a nice fight, too. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Both fights were really tough. <laughs> what was your mindset going into this? You'd, you'd beaten him once before. Did that give you an extra sense of confidence or not? Uh, no, not really. You know, like, of course, you need to go in the fight confidence, but you fight the guy like Andre Galvao, you know, like, uh, man, he's like one of the best. I'm a big fan of him. And then... Uh, you know, like uh, the past, it doesn't, you know, like it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, like mean nothing. So the fight was today, and then, you know, like uh, I put a, a, you know, like a good, uh, a good game plan, you know, like uh, finally I, I thought about the game plan, and then uh, work well, and then, you know, the fight was like a very, a very close, but, uh, you know, the referee, two referees, they, they thought they all won, and then I got the victory. How, for, how sure were you coming into this tournament that you were going to meet him in the finals? Uh, you know, like I'm never sure, you know, because we have guys like um, uh, Otavio Souza, my teammate as well. He's like a world champion middleweight, you know, like I have another guys uh, really tough. It's hard to, you know, like to think about, you know, like my, even my, uh, my academy, you know, like some guys would say, uh, man, I I'm going to the tournament to watch you and then uh, Andre Galvão in the final. I don't like to think about that, you know. I like to think fight by fight, you know, like uh, I don't know, you know, I need to win my side of my bracket and then he needs to win his side of the bracket. I always think about that, you know, I don't, I don't even, I don't look the names that I might meet on the final in non-tournament, you know, so I don't think anybody should do that. So when the when the match was over and the decision hadn't been made yet, I could not decide who I thought we should win. Looking back on it, I do agree that you won, but it was so close. Why do you think the refs gave it to you? I don't know. You know, it's hard to know too. You know, I was scared as well. You know, it was close. I know. You know, like I think Andre Galvão. You know, like uh, he was like attack a little bit more, and maybe in the on the minute eight. You know, like uh, he he pushed a little bit the pace, but not like a very effective to pass my guard or anything like that you know I think in the beginning when I was pushing I was set up like a, you know like a very dangerous position almost I got I caught him on triangle you know like my sweeps are a little bit efficient you know like my defense on the you know like on his uh, uh, sweeps attempt I don't know you know like uh, I think uh, maybe the triangle that I almost you know I don't know you know like he's a close fight it's hard to know for sure so you won five thousand dollars today what are you gonna do with it uh, I'm gonna save, you know, like uh, try to, you know, save money, buy a house, you know. So I don't know, you're just gonna give my wife and then she will know like what they're gonna do with, you know. And it was very nice today. I got third place on the, the teams, you know, like with the Grace Bar Northridge. I'm very happy. All right. <laughs> Great job, Homolo. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Classy guy, that Homolo Bahal. Mm. Super. What a gentleman. Yeah. They yeah. both were gentlemen on social media afterwards, too, <laughs> which I appreciate. Fights don't get much better than that. No. And I want to mention that all these matches are available on YouTube for free on the IBJJF channel. Awesome. The fourth and last match, uh, finals match, didn't actually happen. It was mm -hmm. supposed to be between Bruno Bastos and Roberto Alencar. Bruno got injured uh, with an arm lock earlier in the day, and so he wasn't able to do the finals match. But we got an interview with the champ, Roberto Tusa Alencar. Here with Tusa. Tusa, you had a great day today. Unfortunately, you didn't have a finals match, but tell me a little bit about your day. 
Oh yeah, first of all, I wasn't planning to come over here at all. When I get the uh, two weeks notice, you know, to come over here, I love competing, especially in the BJJF, it's an awesome tournament. And one of my teammates, Professor Rafael, was coming here, so it made sense to me. So since the beginning, you know, when I came over here, I was a little bit hassle, you know, was a little unsure, wasn't 100% prepared because we just came from no gear worlds, you know, it's a big transi transition now, but the day started perfect, you know, I got a really tough guy, his name is Gustavo Diaz from Grace of Mai Tai, you know, we were war on, on the standing and I, I got to take it down and started moving forward, you know, I felt a little bit my grip, so I was just playing more strategy and then I moved for the second match, I knew who was going to meet in the same semi final, which is Gustavo Pires, you know, Siri, and we'd be competing, we'd be training on the competition classes, you know, and I kind of, we kind of knew each other's game, so I knew what I was expected. It was my strategy was just stand with him and wait for him to pull guard so he could get some advantage and stuff, which would be hard to finish or get some points, you know. And, and was, unfortunately, in the final, Moron Bass hurt his arm and, and he couldn't compete, but he's an awesome competitor, you know. I was waiting wait for, for the war, but it didn't happen this time, but eventually it would happen again, you know. We all both are competing all the time, and we will see each other in the final someday. Mm -hmm. So this is the first IBGF tournament where people are getting paid. Yeah, so you made five thousand dollars today. What are you gonna do with it? Oh yeah, but I'm gonna try save up. We were here, you know. That's the main rules we have in America to try save for the future, you know. And that's that's it, you know. I'm married. I got married next year, so we're gonna save some for, for the honeymoon and stuff like that. So we're excited. Nice. Very excited with the money. Very smart. All right, thank All you, right. sir. Great job, Tisa. Thank you. So that marked the end of the IBJJ Pro League. It's the first one. I'm sure they're gonna have another one next year. They even hinted about having more than one next year. Wow. Oh, wow. Uh, which seems a little bit strange to me. I don't know how. I mean, it'd be awesome to, to have, for the competitors to make a little more money. That's great. I'm just curious, as far as the rankings go, you know, do you look at the rankings at four different times through a year? If they have four or two different times mm -hmm. out of the year, wouldn't you just be seeing the same guys fighting each other more, like, more than likely? Yeah, I don't know how that would work out with the rankings because the ranking is over the course of a year. But uh, I just say they should just throw some money into the big tournaments. Yeah. Instead of having more pro tournaments, just put some money into the Pans, the Worlds, maybe the Europeans, get more people into those, and then have one real pro tournament at the end of the year where the points really matter. Right. That's yeah, what thought. if there was money for the coolest submission of the tournament? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it would just be outstanding if there was – prize money for first through third in all of our big tournaments. Now you're getting the guys, you're really rewarding them. They can make a little extra money throughout the year, maybe, you know, help pay for their travels, all that good stuff. So I don't know, it'd be, that'd be pretty sweet. So from your point of view, instead of having additional tournaments, just make the worlds that much yeah, better. Yeah, that, that, that's what I would, I think would be more beneficial. Instead of having, you know, four more pro tournaments, just take that and put it into the tournaments that we already have and then have one finale at the end of the year like this. It seems, it seems to me that there's so, there's so many tournaments now, um, maybe it would just help those big ones get bigger. bigger. Yeah. I mean, it's like we said earlier, um, with the Worlds, um, the regard for the medal is already there, so yeah. it seems to make sense to invest in what's, you know, where the momentum already is. Yeah. So we'll see. Uh, as soon as we get some more information from the IBGF about uh, 2013's plans, We'll let you guys know. Well, now that the Pro League uh, discussion is finished, let's take a look at some new products. A brand new gi just came out today, and that is the Show Your Roll In Her Honor gi. Let's take a closer look at this. They uh, came out with some brand new sizes specifically for women. I've often heard women complain about the cuts of men's gis and trying to fit in them and looking ridiculous and feeling strange, but these are getting really great reviews from the ladies that have tried them. Just came out today, available and still in most sizes right now on BlueVideos.com. Uh, as most Show Your Roll products go, they probably won't be around for much longer, so if you're looking at get, getting one of these for Christmas or something, now would be a good time to check it out. Cool. And from what you said, Jake, there's a story behind the pink logo too, right? Yeah, it's uh, it's gonna benefit um, breast cancer awareness, so some some uh, some of the proceeds are going to be given to some breast cancer charities, and also there's going to be a, um, a toy drive uh, for kids. Fantastic. That's really cool. Great. Nice of uh, Show Your Roll to uh, give back a little bit to the community like that. Another new product to talk about, and this is uh, from a relatively new brand called Prana. This is uh, called the Remix Gi. It's uh, available in uh, one of my favorite colors of gis, navy blue. This one's going to go on sale on Monday at noon. 
and they're priced at 175 and these are made in very limited quantities so if you're looking at picking one of those up check out buddha videos at noon pacific time on monday yeah 175 isn't bad for a limited gi that's right especially because it's remixed right <laughs> it's better than the original mix <laughs> right <laughs> So we got some uh, some mail. We get mail every week uh, from viewers out there. Thank you guys for sending that in. And if you have any questions for us or comments, the email address is twibjj at buddhavideos.com. This mail comes from Jose Castillo. He says, I've been training for about a year, and a lot of my classmates are taking private lessons to improve. Are they worth the price? Sean, what do you think? Are your private lessons worth it? <laughs> yeah. No, never do it. Never do it. Yeah, of course. Of course they are. Um, because it's individual, you know, it's just an individual, you get individual attention when you take a private lesson and you can have those questions tailored to, you know, your professor or your instructor out there. They're totally worth it. I mean, um, like I said before, if you get one new thing, one little thing you can use that you have to invest whatever in, it's, it's worth it. If it's going to make a difference in your game over the course of time, like Absolutely. And it's and as an instructor, it is extremely hard to teach in a class of even in class of if you had a class of ten people, like it's very hard to tailor that class to all ten people. Every person is different. They use different things, certain things they like other than you know, so I think private lessons are a great way to benefit your training. Do you think it's ever too early to take a private lesson? No, I don't. Because if you take it right away, even if it's on the a couple of fundamentals. It's just going to get your game jump started. I can actually attest to that because when I first started, we didn't. The academy I was at didn't have a separated fundamentals program, and so I was training with guys that were more advanced. And for all, I mean, I was drowning because they were referring to things I'd never heard of. Guillotine. What's what? Yeah. And so I ended up doing um, privates for about a month, and it was twice a week because I got a package deal, and it was just to to kickstart me into sort of the language of jujitsu, and. I mean, I wouldn't say everybody should do it, but I wouldn't dissuade anyone because it, it, it did wonders for me to get me really going in the sport. And I think it fed into my passion. But as soon as I began to understand the language and you know, had someone that I could say, I was wondering about this and get immediate response, it helped kind of you know, really build my fire. Did you take many private lessons early on? Sean? No, I, I actually didn't, you know, but I, I think uh, um, an anomaly. I, I, you know, I, I was at the school like hours and upon hours upon hours upon hours every day. And I just was lucky because I got to train all the time with all the best guys at the school. So I was fortunate. But I, if I didn't have that, I would have, you know, for sure. Because basically, you know, the guys all beat me up every day. And then they would tell me how they beat me up because um, <laughs> we were in the, the little, I was in the little circle where everybody competed and all that stuff. So I didn't need to, I guess, but um, I've done them. I've done private lessons, and they're fantastic. If you can afford them, I, I think they're a great deal. I've only taken one private lesson uh, in my career. Uh, it was with Dave Camarillo uh, on closed guard arm bars. It was a great seminar. But, you know, in my line of work, I've been able to train with a lot of the best names out there, and that one-on-one -on -one attention is, is really awesome. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's, it's worth mentioning you've essentially done private lessons in some form or fashion. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think the average prices go for a one-hour private lesson? Man, I would say anywhere from probably 80 to 200, I would say. You know, somewhere, you know, it just depends. I don't know. But what would you suggest if someone was going to do a private lesson? What would you suggest to the person to get the most out of the, the dollar or the time that they're going to spend? In a Having lesson? an agenda. Right. You know, that's, I think, when... Um, Teaching a private, I think that's the, the 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 fault of that I see the most is a student will come and say, "Hey, I want to do a private." Great, and if you leave it up to chance and you show up, you're the instructor and you just show up and like, "All right, what are you going to work on?" And probably fifty or sixty percent of the time, the student says, "Uh, I, I don't know. I, yeah, I'm, I don't really, you know." So if you're the student, you, you should have the responsibility of having an agenda. Have an agenda over that private and know what you want to work on because that will really benefit you big time. I mean, not to put words in your mouth, but would you say that's beneficial to 
have something in mind to have a private for, like my spider guard. I want to work on some spider guard sweeps. Absolutely. And have a specific private for a specific technique or position. Absolutely. And if you don't know what you want to work on, have a meeting with your instructor before the private, not like the day of the private, uh, you know, a day before or a week before would be better. And then ask your instructor, hey, I don't really know what I want to work on, but I want to do a private with you next week. Could we figure out? And then the instructor has time to prepare and go over what, all right, where, where is the student at in their training? And now I can put my lesson together for that private so it can be a nice individual lesson, you know? Has it ever happened that a student has asked you for a private and you've kind of been watching them and you said, you know, this is something I'd really like to give to you or it's something that I'd like to see you do? A absolutely, absolutely. That, and that's where, you know, it's, having that meeting beforehand is always good because, but yeah, if, if you, especially if you're, if it's a student that's in your class all the time, you you got an idea. If you're watching them and training with them, you have an idea. So if they just pop one on you, you can say, hey, I want to do private. What should I work on? Oh, yeah, I think you should work on this. Yeah, Jose, thanks for the question. And again, if you guys have any other questions or comments for next week, TWIBJJ at BudoVideos.com is the email address. Uh, for today's lesson, <laughs> your private lesson from Sean Williams, it's going to be under the double under guard pass. Uh, how to stop that. So we saw that. We're going to see a clip here. We saw Homolo do that very effectively against Andre Galvao. Andre is a great double under guard passer. Here you see him in the position. And uh, watch a little bit how what Homolo is doing here. So yeah. before we get out there, Sean, Homolo being 6'2", 6'3", and me yeah. being 5'7", is this a long leg technique? or No, not at all. You see how he's keeping the legs off the, the traps, basically he's keeping it down by the elbows, he's getting, he's creating distance. Um, and now we'll see when we go on the mats, there's some, there are two very definitive positions that the passer can take. So we'll see that when we get on the mats. That one happened to be where Homolo could stay on the sleeves the whole entire time because Galvan's body was sort of elongated. So, and that's the, that's the real goal for the, for the guard players, to elongate the passer and not let the hips come underneath the, the chest where then they can get strong enough to flip you upside down and all kinds of things like this. So yeah, Homolo did a great job there, especially because Galvan at the end there was really going bananas. Uh, because, uh, you know, that he needed to score an advantage or something. So he was really going crazy, and Homolo just kept him at bay, did really nice, some simple defense. I'd love to take a look at it. Cool. Your private lesson is going to start right after the break, so don't go anywhere.